Hi everybody, my name is Zach and welcome to Camp TV. Are you ready for some summer fun? Me too! <laughs> now as your head counselor, I will be introducing you to all sorts of cool activities. Arts, crafts, games, math, and science, as well as some of my favorite books, nature, and theater. I will be here to take you from one activity to the next. So follow me on Camp TV. This program was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Additional funding was provided by Joan Gans Cooney. Oh, hi. <laughs> nice to see you. How long have you been standing there? Huh, I think I might have dozed off for a bit. But I mean, can you blame me? Look at this place. <sighs> Crystal blue waters, warm breezes, waves crashing. Ah, I'm just so relaxed. And smell that fresh sea air. Does anything scream summer more than the perfect beach day? Now, it may be a little tricky getting to the beach this summer, so let's bring the beach to us. Grab a towel and some sunblock, because life's a beach. It's beach day on Camp TV. I think I better go splash some cold water on my face. Waves, here I come. Ooh, hot sand, hot sand. Jump, dance, play. It's time to get active. Let's move. My name is Emily Meisner, and I'm a teaching artist with National Dance Institute. The class today is designed for children in kindergarten, first and second grade, but of course, all are welcome to come and dance with us. We're gonna teach you now a dance about river creatures. So let's make our best river creature pose. Ready? All right, dancers, make your best river creature pose. Make another one. Anything you want. It can be a scary river creature. It can be a funny river creature. Oh, yeah. We're going to do fish. We're going to do... What else are we going to do? We're going to do like this. River creatures. River creatures. Have you ever seen an eel? A slithering eel? So we're going to do eel. We're going to call it a um, water snake. Because in the Hudson River, it's called a water snake. We have a water snake. Ooh, that's a good one. Water snake. All right. So, my dancer's here, my dancer's here. Here's the first step. You go like this, ready? Ready, steady, I go first. River creatures, river creatures. Go with me, river creatures, river creatures. Yes, and I think of it like claws. Even though we know, of course, not all the creatures in a river have claws, but we make our claw pose because it's kind of really, really fun. So we go low, low. River creatures. Beautiful. All right, then creature number two, water snake. Very slithery. It's like an eel, slithery. But we're going to do it this way. Water snake. Water snake. Do it with us. Water snake. Water snake. Yes. Good. Beautiful job with that, dancers. We're going to do each part twice. River creatures. River creatures. Water snake. Water, then it repeats. River creatures, river creatures. Water snake, water snake. Let's try that with some music. Here we go. Get ready for those river creatures. Here we go, river creatures. Pump down 
Creatures go. Let's say that together. The words are going to be coming across the screen. Ready, ready, say the words. Rivers flowing high to low. Watch the river creatures go. Oh, yeah. And there's like an emphasis on that go. Here's what you're going to do. Rivers, show me your best river. Going side to side. The rivers are moving, flowing. Rivers flowing high. You got that part. To low. And then you get a dance party. Watch the river creatures go. You dance party like your best river creatures. Watch the river creatures go. And you make any final picture that you want that's your river creature. It can be anything you want. Use your imagination. All right? Let's put those parts together. River flowing high to low. Watch the river creatures go. Do it with us. Just follow along. We'll probably do it a couple times. All right, dancers. River creatures are ready to rock. Here we go. River flowing high to low. Watch the river creatures go. And hold it. Make sure you always hold your pose. Yes, dancers. Let's do it again. Just that part. Ready, steady. Here we go. River flowing. Your 
there. We're there. Let's put all the parts together. River creatures. Water snake. River creatures. Water snake. Fish. Eagle. River's flowing. Follow us. Thank you so much for dancing with us today. So this crazy thing happened to me while you were off at your last activity. I'm strolling along the shoreline, collecting seashells, and I spotted the perfect one. You know the kind, completely intact, nothing icky stuck to the bottom, really just right. So I picked it up, put it in my pocket, and suddenly I feel this tiny pinch on the back of my heel. I look down, around, I see nothing. So I shrug it off, continue walking, and mere seconds later, I feel something else, this time on the top of my foot. I look down, and lo and behold, there he is in all his naked glory. A little hermit crab was jumping up and down, obviously trying to get my attention. Turns out that perfect shell already had a rightful owner. So naturally, I put the shell back on the sand and apologized sincerely, but he was having none of it. He scurried into his home, and before he took off, he kicked some sand my way. It didn't make much of a dent, seeing as he couldn't aim higher than my pinky toe. But I ask you, did he really have to be that crabby about it? Curiosity and wonder. Let's discover together. It's science wow. Hi, everyone. My name is Miss Orphanatopoulos, and I am an enrichment teacher in Hazlitt, New Jersey. I am so excited to work with you today. Today we are going to do a STEM challenge and we are going to think like engineers. Today's challenge is going to be to build a boat. It's summertime and so many people go out on their boats. They might relax for the day in the ocean or the sea or they may go fishing or do some water sports. So we're gonna see if we can build our very own boat that's going to be able to float on water. You can even test it outside or in a bucket that you have or even your bathtub. So let's first take a look at what some boats look like around the world. Hi, here's a canoe. This is a small boat that's able to float on water and people use it to do sports and go around on a lake or an ocean. Have you ever been in a canoe? Here I am all the way in Greece. This is Carpathos, Greece, and this is a fishing boat. Fishing boats are used to go out and catch fish and octopus and all sorts of things. And they're able to float on water too. Hi, I'm at Dubai and take a look at this boat. It's just a small passenger boat that can take people around the lake. Isn't it beautiful? Hi, I'm on this cruise ship. Isn't it big? This ship is able to take so many people across the oceans. People use them to go on vacation or visit friends and family. Some of these ships even have rides on them. It's pretty amazing how this huge boat can be held up by the water. Let's take a look at another one. Take a look at this cargo ship. Isn't it huge? This ship carries things that we buy in our stores here. It carries things from all different countries and places across the oceans. It has so much weight and it's amazing how it can still be held up in the water. So let's go back to my room and see how all of these boats can actually float. Weren't those boats amazing? 
Boats of all different sizes have buoyancy, which is the ability for the boat to float in the water. When a boat gets put into the water, it actually displaces the water and spreads it out, which gives more room for the boat to sit. Depending on how dense a boat is, it might be able to be larger and float. Density is how much material is packed into a given space. Many boats actually are hollow and have empty spaces inside them. So when you build your boat, think about that. If it's too heavy or it's too thick, it might have trouble floating. So you want to build something that actually has some space inside. And you want to use materials that are a little bit more light. So today's challenge is going to be to build a boat that can float. So before we get started, I want you to gather any materials that you have around the house. It could be some cardboard and paper, popsicle sticks, you might need scissors and tape. Find anything you have and you're going to use that to build with. Before we start building, we're going to think like an engineer. The first step in the engineering design process is to ask, what is the problem and what are some things that might be in our way? So our problem today is to make sure that our boat can actually float. And for more of a challenge, you can even put some weight on it, such as coins or a soup can or something heavy. Our step number two is going to be always to imagine. I want you to take a piece of paper and brainstorm your idea. Jot down some notes and make a little a sketch of what things you have around the house that you can build with. Step number three is going to be to draw your diagram. I want you to draw what you really want to build with the materials you have and how it's going to look. And step four is when you're actually going to create and you get to build your boat. Now engineers always improve their design so even if your boat floats the first time, you can still find a way to make it better. And if your boat doesn't do too well and you see that it's sinking, you might want to improve it and think of what you can do to make it better. People often improve their ideas over and over again and that's okay. So let's start building and brainstorming and see what we can come up with. my boat. I built it out of note cards and popsicle sticks for a base and I even came up with a little straw and a coffee filter for the flag as a sail. And I covered it in tin foil because I didn't want it to uh, get wet when I put it in the water because the paper will get wet but the tin foil should protect it. So I'm going to test my boat out to see how it floats. Here we go. Well, it seems to be floating pretty well and I can try to add some weight on it and see how it does with more weight. I hope your boat comes out great. Remember, it's okay to keep on trying and not give up. I know you can be a super thinker and I can't wait to see what you make. Have fun! Bye! Enjoying your day so far? I'm personally feeling a little guilty about my shell napping experience. So, in honor of that hermit crab, may he live long and prosper, I present to you today's Zach, Zach Challenge. Challenge! 
I'm going to walk back and forth along the perimeter of my kitchen in under 10 seconds. Simple, you say? Hardly. Not when you have to walk like a crab and balance a flip-flop on your stomach at the same time. Let's do this. Music, dance, magic, and more. Step right up to center stage. Hello! Hello! Hello? 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 Hello! Hi! My name is Marisol, and I'm a teaching artist with the New Victory Theater. I am an actor, a director, a creator of original work, and sometimes I clown. I'm coming to you today from my apartment in Philadelphia, where I live with my partner and my friend, Ziggy. That's right, that's my friend Ziggy. One of the fundamental principles of a lot of clowning is something called mask take. Mask take is when the clown or the character gives a take to the audience, showing the audience their mask. The mask stands in for maybe the whole face or your mask might be a red nose, sometimes called the tiniest mask, which some clowns wear, but not all. Now, mask take is important because it's all about sharing with the audience how you feel, your reaction to something. And this for me is the most magical thing about clowning, is that sense of connection with an audience. So mask take is so important. Now, it can be a little bit strange if you have a partner on stage with you to remember to mask take because we're used to uh, playing on stage with and to our partner rather than with and to an audience. And that's why we are gonna practice mask take uh, today with a little game and a little song. So to get started, all you need to do is pick a song that you and your partner both know well. All right, Zig, you and I are gonna sing the alphabet song just like this. When you are singing, you're gonna look at the audience. And when you're not singing, you're gonna look at your partner. So simple. We're going to pass the ten attention and the focus back and forth between us and practice looking at you when we sing. Just like this. Zig, would you like me to start? Uh, uh, yes, please. Okay, no problem, Zig. All right, here we go. A, B, C, D. Okay. H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y and Z. Now I know my a, B, C's. Next time, won't you sing with me? Ah. Now, you may have noticed in that last round that we very politely tossed the focus back and forth between us. But if we add a little bit of character onto this clown relationship, well, it might not always go so smoothly, eh, Zig? <laughs> so, for example, um, one of us might decide to sing a little too long. Q-R-S-T-U-V 
W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? Me, 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 me. Now. For our last round of practice with mask take, we are going to imagine that uh, Ziggy and I have two very different styles in which we like to sing. I'm gonna sing in a sort of operatic style, and my friend Ziggy here is going to sort of rap the song. You ready, Zig? Absolutely, yeah. All right, here we go. <coughs> A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Q, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, N, Y, and Z. <clears throat> now I know more ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? <clears throat> Next time, won't you sing with me? friends, now it's your turn to practice your mask take. You can practice with a parent or guardian, with a sibling or a cousin, or even a favorite stuffed animal like I have today. <clears throat> I am not an animal. I am a mythical creature. Oh, uh. Sorry, Zig. You can practice with your favorite, beloved, stuffed, mythical creature. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Ziggy. All right, friends. Have a great time, and we will see you next time here. After a while, crocodiles. <laughs> Ready for some math that counts? Count on! Hi, I'm Shayna from Bedtime Math, and today we're going to play a game called Pirate Treasure Hunt. First, we'll plot points on a grid to make a map. Then, we'll pick numbers to see which player lands on Treasure Island first. In order to make the map, you'll need a grid. It can be giant on the floor made of masking tape, or smaller made of paper on a tabletop. A grid has two axes. The x-axis goes across the bottom on our grid, and the y-axis goes up and down along the left side. The lines on each axis are labeled starting with zero and going all the way to 10 and 14. Now that we have our grid, we need to plot some coordinates. Let's try a few together. The first one is 3, 1. The 3 tells us how far to go along the x-axis, so cross 3. And the 1 tells us how far to go up along the y-axis, so up 1. Right where those two lines meet, I plot a point. Okay, the next one is 8, 1. So this time, I'll go over eight and up one again, and I'll plot another point. Then I'll use a straight edge to connect those two points. Let's try one more, 10, four. This time, I'll go across 10 
and up four. X before Y, just like the alphabet. And we keep going and going, plotting all of our points until we've made our map. A ship, its sail, and an island. Playing with us today are pirate math friends, Jordan, Emma, and Cooper. Their treasure maps are already made. Now it's time to play and see who lands on the treasure island first. When it's their turn, each friend will choose a coordinate pair, but no peeking. Then they'll go to that spot on their grid. If they land anywhere on the boat, they get to go again. If they land in the ocean, it'll be the next person's turn. And when they land on the island, they're the winner. Let's start with Jordan. Eight, seven. I landed in the ocean. And the first one that I got was two, eight. So I am in the ocean today, so I'll go again. Good try, Emma. It looks like you and Jordan need to swim back to the boat. Now it's Cooper's turn. Eleven, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm on the island! <laughs> I win. So now you know how to plot some points and race to find a treasure. Give it a try. It can be big, small, you can even make your own picture. Just have some fun and sprinkle a little math in. Bye. A little birdie told me it's time to go wild. Compared to sandy beaches and giant sand dunes, this may not look like much, but don't be fooled. This habitat is one of the most important in the Great Lakes region. Oh, you don't believe me? Well, good thing we're taking a field trip. Before we get into why this habitat is so special, there are two important questions to ask. Number one, what is a habitat anyway? And number two, where is my guide? We'll break down question one while I go solve question two. To put it simply, a habitat is a place where an organism or a community of organisms live. Some habitat types might be easy to spot, like a beach, which is technically the zone extending from the water's edge to the limit of the highest storm waves, or dunes, which stabilize and resupply beachfronts with sand while supporting a diversity of plants and wildlife all their own. But the Great Lakes region is vast, and there are hundreds of different coastal habitat types that are less known, but just as important. One of those can be found in the Metzger Marsh Wildlife Area, just east of Toledo, Ohio. I met with Matt Kovach there. He is a coastal program manager for the Nature Conservancy. He works as part of a team restoring wetlands on the edge of Lake Erie. And that means he knows this habitat as well as anyone. Matt, thanks so much for meeting with us. So could you explain to us what are some of the defining characteristics of the Great Lakes wetlands? Sure, so Great Lakes wetlands are really, really important and special places. Mm -hmm. There really aren't many of them left. Yeah. We've lost about 95% of our wetlands in the state of Ohio. They provide really, really important wildlife habitat for fish and birds and mammals and all sorts of things. You know, there's a lot of food there. There's a lot of, pla a lot of habitat, a, a lot of homes for different types of animals that live out here. Uh, a lot of things that migrate, a lot of birds that migrate from south to north and north to south. Can you show us some of your favorite parts? Sure, come out with me. I'll show you some All of these right. cool places. Let's go. So these are the coastal wetlands that are on uh, the southern shore of Lake Erie. Okay. And these are some of those habitats I told you about that are those really important coastal wetland habitats in the Great Lakes. So this is one of our really common wetland plants up here. Yeah. It's called uh, either American Water Lotus or Yellow Lotus. It's got a bunch of common names. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, it grows really well in, you know, about three foot of water. And we wow. find it kind of fringing in a lot of those between the shallower areas of a lot of our marshes and the deeper areas that are kind of dominated by that, um, 
some of those submerged aquatic plants that we'd seen earlier. Wetlands can act as nature's kidneys. They can filter a lot of runoff before that water can come out here and fuel uh, algal growth. So this is a muskrat hut. This is one of the mammals that likes to live out in these areas. And what they do is they build their homes like this, build these mounds up, and they'll have a little compartment inside of there that they'll use as their, you know, as their living room, and they'll stay in there all winter long. <laughs> their living room. It's so complex, all those different things. And so what kind of things do you think from out here or do you think are made up in this nice so, little nesting place? So there's a lot of plants that they use to construct these. Most of it is cattail, and that's okay. a plant that's growing right this here. right here? Next to you. Yep, exactly. Oh, wow. A lot of it is that. There's some smartweed growing on it too. Uh, smart and they'll weed. smart weed, and there's some other plants that they'll uh, they'll use. They'll use that combined with mud that they pull up from the bottom to basically build this whole structure. And if you could, if we could see inside of it, you'll see that it's it's kind of hollowed out. There's a big open area inside of there, right, right. and there's actually an entrance right here wow. on that side that they'll use to uh, to go inside. So what of about it. the cattail is so unique that they use so much of it? It's so significant. They love cattail. Right. It's a food source. It's one of their mm. favorite foods, and that's why if you look out here, all these dead uh, these dead sticks sticking up yeah. is basically cattail strands. If you look right over there, you can see one that's kind of been chewed up quite a bit. Um, that's probably from the family muskrats that live right in All here. All right, so they're going out for dinner. It's one, exactly, it's All one right. of their favorite foods. Matt, thank you so much for showing us Metzger Marsh. It's beautiful out here, and I think we understand a little bit more why preserving habitats like this is so important. So thank you for being one of the people that helped to protect sure. it. But no that's the end of our field trip. I'm Morgan. Thank you so much for coming along with me. We'll see you next time, and we will be back. Okay, good. All right. You took the words right out of my mouth. Right on. I come from homemade spaghetti. I come from the wonder of Stevie. I come from blue skies endlessly. I come from shorts and a tee. I come from Southern Cali. Hi everybody, my name is Jamie. I'm a teaching artist with the New Victory Theater. I'm coming to you from Astoria, Queens. I hope that you're feeling safe and feeling cared for. And today's kind of fun because we're gonna be talking about home. I know we've been spending a lot of times in what we might consider home, um, but we're gonna be using that as a springboard of inspiration for what home means to us. So I've created um, my own poem, and I encourage you to write your own. Um, it's very simple. If you just come here, I'll show you. You're gonna fill out on your own piece of paper, I come from, and then you'll write in first, the food that tastes like home to me. Then I come from the music of my soul. Then I come from the way the sky looks at home. I come from, I feel most myself when I wear this, an article or articles of clothing. I come from name of the place you call home. So once you fill that out like I did, you're gonna figure out how you wanna present it. And it's, it's often best to rehearse a couple of times. Often the best ideas come after you've tried it a few times, and then you can show it to maybe somebody else in your home. Um, you might wanna think about an entrance so I'll enter from here slowly, or I'll enter from here quickly, yeah? Um, you'll think about a gesture that you wanna do. So for, I come from homemade spaghetti, I might make my arms like spaghetti pasta. Um, you might think of a place where you wanna be totally still, or you wanna, might wanna think of a place where you're a little bit quicker. Um, Think about the words and adding a gesture. So blue skies endlessly. I might look up at the blue skies and see those and bring my arms across the sky. Also, um, you can change the way that you say things. So you could say something really quickly or really slowly. Shorts and a T or shorts and a T. Or you could speak a little louder, not too loud. 
or a little softer. So I come from shorts and a tee, or I come from shorts and a tee. Yeah? Different ways of playing around with the dynamics. Once you've got that and you've practiced that, you can even mark on your paper loud here or soft here or stand here or sit here. Uh, you can even bring in a chair or a, a piece of furniture that you work with in your piece. Once you do that, you can practice it a couple of times and then find a way to present it. You could present it on camera like I'm doing or to an audience. So that's the poem. It's the I Come From poem, developed by many teaching artists many, many moons ago. And um, I find it to be really beautiful. You're going to continue to say I come from and then what you have for each prompt. So once again, I'll try it one more time and share with you my own I Come From poem. I come from homemade spaghetti. I come from the wonder of Stevie. I come from blue skies endlessly. I come from shorts and a tee. I come from Southern Cali. That is the I Come From poem. Thank you for joining us. Bye. What's a beach day without building a sandcastle? Nothing, I say. Absolutely nothing. Let's get to it then. Not only are we going to make a sandcastle, we're going to make what's needed in the first place. Some sand. You heard me right. We are going to make some sand from scratch. You will need a bowl, a mixing spoon, a measuring cup, some baking soda, and some baking powder, and some dish detergent. First, mix two parts baking soda with one part baking powder and one part dish detergent. Then, mix well with a spoon. Add more baking powder as you stir to make the mixture more fluffy. Then, knead the mixture well, adding more baking powder as needed. And there you have it, your very own homemade sand. Now let's finally get to making that sand castle. Perfect. Daytime or nighttime, it's always time for story time. It's story time with me, Miss Darlene, and I'm here to read to you from my home in Brooklyn, New York. The title of today's read aloud is... Pete the Cat and the Perfect Pizza Party. Written and illustrated by Kimberly and James Dean. The characters in the story help us to learn how important it is to listen to each other's ideas and how fun it could be to try new things. During the story, there will be brief pauses for you to look and think along with me. When you hear this sound, it means I'm getting ready to turn the page. So let's put on our thinking caps and our listening ears and let's have fun reading. Pete the Cat loves pizza. Pete the Cat loves parties too. Pete had an idea of what he could do. He would have the perfect pizza party. Pete's friends all arrived. It was time to build the perfect pizza together that would make the pizza even better. Pete thought the perfect pizza would be pepperoni with extra cheese. Mm-hmm. It's a party, a party, a pepperoni pizza party. But everyone did not agree. <laughs> Cat 
Hallie said, pepperoni would be just fine, but I really love pretzels on mine. Pete and the gang were puzzled. Pretzels? Well, that's something new. But maybe pretzels could be groovy too. It's a party, a party, a pepperoni pretzel pizza party. Squirrel said, pepperoni and pretzels will be just fine, but I really love pistachios on mine. Pete and the gang were puzzled. Pistachios? Well, that's something new, but maybe pistachios could be groovy too. It's a party, a party, a pepperoni pretzel pistachio pizza party. Hmm, friends, let's stop for a minute. Have any of you noticed that all of the foods that they're adding to their pizza start with the same letter? Hmm, pepperoni, pretzel, pistachios. Those all start with the letter Hmm, I have an idea. Maybe we can predict what types of foods that start with the letter P that they'll add to the pizza next. When we predict, we think about what will happen before we turn to the next page. Let's give it a try. Think of all the foods you know that start with the letter P that the characters might add to their perfect pizza. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think of some. Let's see if any of the foods you predicted are on the next page. Let's see. Grumpy Toad said, pepperoni, pretzels, and pistachios would be just fine, but I really love pickles on mine. Did any of you predict that pickles would be on the pizza? Pete and the gang were puzzled. Pickles? Well, that's something new, but maybe pickles could be groovy too. It's a party. A party, a pepperoni, pretzel, pistachio, pickle, pizza party. Let's make another prediction. What food that begins with the letter P do you think will be on the pizza next? Take a couple of seconds to think about it. Let's see if what you predicted is on the next page. Gus said, pepperoni, pretzels, pistachios, and pickles would be just fine. But I really love popcorn on mine. Did any of you predict popcorn would be on the pizza next? Pete and the gang were puzzled. Popcorn? Well, that's something new, but maybe popcorn could be groovy too. It's a party, a party, a pepperoni, pretzel, pistachio, pickle, popcorn, pizza party. Can you make another prediction while Pete drives the party bus? Let's think of another food that begins with the letter P that the characters might add to the pizza next. Here's some time to think about it. Alligator said, pepperoni, pretzels, pistachios, pickles, and popcorn will be just fine. But really, I love papaya on mine. Did anyone predict Papaya would be on the pizza next. Who knew? Now Pete and the gang were really puzzled. 
Papaya? Well, that's something new, but maybe papaya could be groovy too. It's a party, a party. A pepperoni, pretzel, pistachio, pickle, popcorn, papaya, pizza party. Why do you think Pete and his friends are excited about the pizza party? I'll give you a moment to think. I think they were excited to share their ideas and to try new things. Pete and the gang piled the pepperoni, pretzels, pistachios, pickles, popcorn, and papaya on top. The pizza was so high, they had to stop. Ding! The pizza was done. Trying something new might be fun. They all built up the courage to take the first bite. And the pepperoni, pretzel, pistachio, pickle, Popcorn, papaya, pizza was out of sight. Mm -hmm. Dynamite, just right. In the end, the perfect pizza is a pizza shared with friends. The end. I'm so glad I got to read the story to you today. This story really helped me to learn how important it is to listen to the ideas of our friends and how fun it could be to try something new. I wonder, what are you going to put on your next pizza? To keep the fun going, you can have your very own pretend perfect pizza party at home. What would you put on your pizza? You can add any topping you would like to your perfect pizza or just like in the story, you can choose any letter you like and see how many foods you can come up with that begin with that letter. And then have fun piling it high on top of your pizza. All you'll need is a paper and pencil to draw your perfect pizza, some crayons or markers to color it in, and you can ask a trusted adult to help you draw and cut out your favorite toppings to pile high on your perfect pizza. First, draw your favorite perfect pizza shape. Then, color in some tomato sauce. And don't forget the cheese. Mm -hmm. After you've finished drawing and cutting out your favorite toppings with a trusted adult, you can go ahead and add them to your perfect pizza. And remember, the perfect pizza is shared with friends. So grab everyone in the house and have your very own pretend perfect pizza party. I hope you enjoyed the story. Thanks for watching! This program was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Additional funding was provided by Joan Gans Cooney. Content provided by these institutions.